All right, uh, we're going to get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 2022 Revney Prop Tech Challenge, Getting to Carbon Net Zero. I'm Sandy Jacklow, co-founder of the Prop Tech Challenge, a member of the Revney Technology Committee and Chief Technology Officer at Empire State Realty Trust. You know, it's hard to believe that the Prop Tech Challenge has transformed in such an, an enormous way. We started over a weekend hackathon back in 2017, and it was truly happenstance that the other co-founders, Ryan Baxter and Duke Long and I, we met that day. We said, we have to take this to the next level. You know, and here we are, you know, nearly five years later, we've raised awareness to 350 solutions, solving today's complex problems for the real estate industry. And to show you how important this category is and what we're going to talk about today, you know, dealing with climate change decarbonization, we received over 60 submissions across our four categories. And today, during demo day, we have two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And you're gonna see our top finalists showcasing, showcasing their innovative solutions on how real estate can address climate change, reduce carbon emissions with the goal of decarbonizing our buildings, creating a better place to live and work. So with that, I wanna personally thank NYSERDA, who has been incredible over these past many years. They've been the best partner I can ever imagine to have worked with over so many different prop tech challenges leading the way, supporting real estate, the technology firms, and they have these other, outside of supporting just the Prop Tech Challenge, they have these other amazing world-class programs like the Empire Building Challenge. Um, you know, I also want to thank Commercial Observer for their support and partnership in helping us publicize this challenge and get the digital word out, which has been so, so important to raise awareness. And quite honestly, you know, here we are. I can think of no better way to start Demo Day with live from New York. It's Rebney Prop Tech Challenge. And to get us started, I'm thrilled to introduce Max Gross, Editor-in-Chief of Commercial Observer. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and uh, thank you all for being live in New York. Um, so as Sandy said, I'm Max Gross. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, Commercial Observer. Um, I would like to officially stay, thank um, Rebney, NYSERDA, um, for inviting us to participate in this extremely important uh, conversation. Uh, this year's Prop Challenge uh, focused on carbon net zero. And it was of special interest to our team at Commercial Observer. Um, over the past two years, uh, we have increased our coverage not only on prop tech with a weekly newsletter, um, but also on ESG, um, including sustainability, energy efficiency, and positive climate action. Um, so on behalf of the entire Commercial Observer team, I would like to congratulate all participants in this year's uh, prop tech challenge um, as you work to deliver, it, deliver the innovative technologies with the goal of reducing carbon emissions throughout the built environment. Uh, green development is mission critical for real estate um, and for urban planning. And we are in need of the ingenuity and creativity that will be shared throughout today's program. Um, I know we have an action packed program. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce my colleague and one of your MCs for today, Robin Reese, Executive Director of Commercial Observer. Thanks, Max. I want to thank everyone for coming. For those of you who don't know, we also have people tuning in on Zoom. So hello to all the Zoom folks who didn't want to get dressed and come here today. So welcome from uh, your living room. Uh, I want to echo Max's uh, thoughts and thank Rebney and uh, Nizerta for having us here today. You know, positive change takes, takes endurance and creativity, but it also takes strategic collaboration. So we're really looking forward to propelling that change through our partnership with Rebney and Izerta. Today's uh, event is a great start to that. So without further ado, let's welcome Sandy back up to the stage, who's gonna get the program started. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Max and Robin. And I am so happy to personally introduce and welcome Patrick O'Shea, Director of um, Market Development at Nyserta to deliver our keynote. You know, Patrick has been and continues to be a true leader in the industry. He's been integral to the development of New York State's carbon neutral building roadmap. 
He's also been responsible for ensuring the successful design and execution of clean energy market strategies for existing commercial, institutional, industrial buildings, as well as building codes and new constructions across all markets. So he's truly been an amazing man in this industry and really a true leader. So come on up, Patrick. Thank you, Sandy. I know, I know, I know. So first of, first of all, I want to welcome all of you and thank all the participants in the uh, PropTech Challenge and then give congratulations to today's finalists. We have some uh, firms who've been here before because they've been out improving their products and services and we have some new firms that we're welcoming today. So this is our fourth collaboration with Rebney. I think we missed the first one, but we've been in every other PropTech challenge. And it's the broadest one in terms of dedication to energy efficiency and carbon emissions. But remember, beyond energy and carbon, resiliency and indoor air quality are still paramount to what we're doing with buildings in New York. As we go forward, there, there is a need to reach out more fully to engage and empower tenants. And we've been trying to support that effort. Many firms here today have provided services that give tenants tools, give building owners tools so for more productive engagement with tenants on decarbonization and energy efficiency. We also simply cannot electrify thermal loads. Uh, how many are aware that we already have load pocket issues in New York City, for example, with electric, right? We just can't simply take the thermal load that exists today and dump that onto the electric grid to be built out and added to. That's just too expensive. So we really need to look at re-engineering our thermal loads and also look at options such as green hydrogen as a part, a part of the, a GHG free solution to thermal loads. And I look forward to that work and I look forward to hearing from today's finalists and the solutions that they propose to these pressing issues. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna start our program with a fireside chat. I'd love to bring up to the stage and welcome Michael Daschel, Senior Vice President of Operations at Brookfield Properties, and Michael Eisner, Senior Vice President of Property Management at RxR Realty. They're gonna be talking about energy and carbon management and optimization. So our ability to accurately measure and report on carbon emissions and how these related energy management programs are so important and integral to the way we both, as building owners and tenants, reduce consumption and associated emissions as we strive to achieve net carbon zero. And the one thing that's most important about that sentence is we all have to realize that it is not only the landlord's obligation, it's the tenants too. And we really have to, as building owners and managers, partner with our tenants to get there and reach our ultimate goal. So with that, Michael and Michael. Hi, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sandy, thanks for uh, teeing us up. Uh, you hit it right there with the tenant engagement. That's one of my favorites. And Michael here is going to talk a little bit about the uh, energy validation. Yep. So I think what we'll do is we'll kind of tee up categories one and two. Uh, we'll do a brief intro of each category. We're going to have uh, kind of a back and forth about our own perspectives on each. And then we'll launch right into the demo. So um, kicking it off with category one, the uh, carbon measurement, verification, reporting, and accounting category. Uh, this is near and dear to our hearts. I mean, for anyone who's an owner out there who's made a net zero commitment, you need to be able to prove it, right? You need to be able to measure what you've committed to do publicly. You need to be able to do that in a way that's legitimate, that's transparent, that you can show your tenants, your investors, your lenders, the public, anyone who you want to be able to basically demonstrate the seriousness of your commitment, you have to have the data there, all right? So that is one, you know, picking your baseline, picking how you're gonna measure it, dedicating yourself to a particular framework or methodology that goes there. And you have to have some kind of system that you can use to check in on progress, 
to report your progress and then to kind of measure and analyze what has been going on so you can project forward that path and really start thinking about where you're gonna be along the milestone dates that you set for that commitment. And you know, unless you have that data, unless you have that solid reporting platform, your projections aren't gonna be that accurate, your, your path to get to zero is not going to be that dependable and you may get lost along the way. So that's really underlined the, you know, the fundamental importance of this category from my perspective. Couldn't have said it better. I'm glad you did. Uh, number two is the building and tenant energy management and optimization. And you know, the first thing we have to do is we have to provide transparency. If we want to work as a partnership with our tenants, we have to let our tenants know what they're doing. And uh, I think a lot of the tenants out there are, are in business to do their business, not to worry about ESG, sustainability, and carbon net zero, right? That's the landlord's job. So uh, if we're gonna have a true partnership with them, if we're gonna move the needle, considering that they use 60% of that energy in a building, uh, we need to engage them. And how do you do that? Well, the first is you have to tell them what that data is. And then the second is, is you have to entice them to try and reduce it. Um, and I think a, a great example is, uh, you know, during the pandemic, we were looking at all of our energy bills and our energy bills didn't decrease along with the population of our buildings. And the reason is, is because of all the data that was hooked up, all the computers that are hooked up and the equipment that just kept running and running and running to sustain the building. So tenants didn't realize that, landlords, quite frankly, didn't realize that. So uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to do here. A couple of the things that we want to talk about with these um, with this category specifically is how does the solution help building owners use less energy to heat and cool the buildings so on top of just a platform that gives you that are there physical things that we're doing to change the building like let's start there let's get that core let's get that envelope uh insulated let's make sure that we're not wasting energy by just sending it out into the atmosphere uh so that's the first part and then the second is how does the solution help the building owners and tenants manage to reduce plug loads and that's the part that we were just talking about you've got to know what you're using to start off with so uh these two categories i think really go hand in hand um and i love the fact that you know mike comes from an asset management perspective and i come from a property management perspective. Uh, so Mike, you know, from a property management perspective, I love all the toys that I saw. I love those 60 submissions that I read through. I want to buy them all, but my asset managers never give me the money. So if I come to you and I say, hey, this is going to help us change the world, what do I have to do to convince you to give me the money? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. So you have to remember that from the asset manager's perspective, we are the owner's representative for that particular asset. We're the ones in the organization who are really responsible for increasing value over time. And so any of these toys, these platforms, these kind of solutions that come from in front of us, we wanna make sure that they're aiding us in that path. You think about how you add value to a property, right? You think about, okay, your primary customers or your tenants, right? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna make sure that they stay around, reduce turnover, increase how much renewable, uh, how many people renew at your property, right? Boost the rents make an attractive place for people to actually come to. And what's gonna do all that is the tenant's gonna to want to love to be at your building. They want to know that you're being a responsible owner. And so, for example, on the carbon net zero theme, uh, if you're in a property that has committed to go net zero and the owner can prove it, can show it, can message that through its events, right? Can be able to share that data with tenants, with the public, I mean, we already are getting tenants who are looking at our brand new development saying, are you gonna go renewable? Can you help us along our own renewable journey? Mm -hmm. And again, if we have the tools and the products that can help us do that, then we're adding value for our owners. All right, so I gotta work on my sales pitch then. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, we, we have some of these tools and, you know, one of the things we found in terms of the optimization side is you get this system and the system will, and a lot of the submissions kind of speak to this. It sits on top of your BMS and it gathers this data and it tells you how to optimize your cooling towers and your pump speeds and your water temperatures and all that stuff based on the variables outside and the occupancy of the building and my mind's exploding already. Um, the next step there would be to automate that information. Instead of just telling our, our, our really great local 94 and 32BJ operating engineers what to do, what if it did it for you, right? What if it took that next step? So as an operator, that's really enticing to me. But as a local 94 operator, they're like, wait a minute, are you taking my job away? And the answer shouldn't be, you're taking my job away. It should be, I'm making your job more efficient. So you don't have to worry that the, the clouds came out for an hour. You can have that being automated, and then you can go about the building making sure everything else is buttoned up and that we aren't you know, uh, losing heat through, through a pipe that's not ventilated or insulated or something to that effect. So I think people need to change the way that they're looking at these optimization platforms. 
Um, and then when you layer on that automation, I think it can be really powerful. I think on that automation front too, it's important to realize that when you have that information, like what are you gonna do with it, right? Part of it for sure can be kind of fed back into the BMS, inform a smarter operation of the building. Uh, but part of that can be gathering data and analyzing it to find patterns that you may never have thought about before. And when you take a fresh look at kind of the underlying data, maybe you can identify some new solutions. You can think more creatively about your capital planning. Um, you know, these things don't necessarily come up unless you look at them a fresh way. You know? I think you said it right there. How many times have we walked around a building and you ask somebody what's going on there and they, why do you do it that way? And they say, well, we've always done it that way. But let's be honest, there's technology today that they, we didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and that's what our, our folks, are, our operational folks are ingrained in doing, and that's the way that our tenants are thinking. And, you know, with all this prop tech that's coming to this market, we start have to change the way we think about our buildings and the way that we run them, and we have to get a little experimental um, and trust that there are those little hidden nuggets that we can un uncover. I think one way to think about that too in a somewhat more creative fashion is, you know, one of the ways that many building owners and operators and property managers have thought about new projects is, you know, does it have a, a payback? Does it have a three-year payback? Can I, can I prove that this is going to pay for itself in a short amount of time? And I think we need to think about that a little differently. You know, I think that um, we can start thinking about the payback more in terms of how long you're actually going to hold the property. You can think about um, layering in the impact that this project may help you avoid penalties for local 97, for example. It may help you, even if the payback's five to 10 years, it may actually help you achieve a net zero goal that's 20 years out there. Mm -hmm. So you can think about these projects in different lights than how they may have traditionally been you know, assessed. And uh, I think that's gonna make us you know, get much further down that road. You know, when we talk about all these other things, we now have to start considering, right? Carbon net zero and local law 97 and all these things. We have our platform spread across and you have a big portfolio and we have a pretty decent sized portfolio and that's a lot to keep track of. And you have to trust your data and you have to also get it organized. So, you know, one of the things we were talking about a little earlier was maybe having a single source of truth. Um, some of the submissions talked about having that single source of truth and being able to provide that to an owner saying, come here, we're going to manage all of your energy needs, whether it's water, whether it's waste, whether it's steam and carbon emissions. And that's a tool that I'm going to find really valuable as an operator. Uh, what about on the asset side? Yeah, so I think that one of the biggest frustrations out there with the software platforms that do exist is exactly what you're saying. I'm going to have to go to this one to get this particular data, and then it's going to export in this format. Then I have to format that myself to put it into this format so I can use it for my reporting. And so if you want that single source of truth, it has to be something that is flexible enough, adaptive enough to be able to inform the owner to do what they want to do from a planning perspective and a reporting perspective. And this is not you know, the, the single stop shop all in one dashboard we're looking for. We're just looking for the kind of data that you can slice and dice and analyze in a way that's meaningful for you as an owner. And again, back to adding value. If you can't use that data to actually inform smart capital planning, smart leasing strategy, smart procurement strategy. I mean, all these things should be actionable. I mean, should, all this data needs to lead to insightful, actionable information. You know, we also talked about renewable energy uh, and getting credits. Um, and I think, you know, you got to retire those credits, right? And, and that comes to data integrity and trusting where you got it from. So I think some of the platforms and some of the, the, the solutions that were offered um, offer that, right? The, that, that single source of truth and then the data integrity on top of it. So have you seen any of that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's critical. So um, you know, as, as many who have started down the path to renewable energy procurement can attest, it's one thing is to decide that you're going to go net zero, right? The other thing is to decide how you're gonna do that. Procurement is a huge way of approaching that. And when I talk about procurement, I'm talking about like energy purchasing, renewable energy credits, you know, the things that you can do from you know, how are you power your building to do that? Uh, there are a hundred different ways you can buy power, right? Yeah. You can buy unbundled recs, you can buy bundled recs, you can buy VPPAs. I mean, like this, this new acronym mix is confusing all by itself. But again, net zero and proving it is the theme. And so if you decide that you're gonna go to way where you're buying energy and the associated recs, you need to be able to show that hour for hour, ideally, you're matching your energy consumption to renewably sourced power. The best way you can do that was a platform that has the clarity to, to show you and all your stakeholders that that's exactly how you're using energy, that's where you got it from, 
you can elevate that, you can be transparent about it, you can talk about it a lot more informed. Um, but again, just being able to, to show how you're buying, how that's meeting your goals, and uh, you know, and where that comes from is just adds a whole level of transparency and validity to your claims. You know, I think, um, I think that it's, uh, it's maybe a couple of years away, right? The, the need for that specific pro product. Right now I can write an ESG report. I could file for GRESB, I could do whatever I want. I'm putting my data in and nobody's real. It doesn't count, right? This is a score that it's a public score and people want to know it. But until 2024 comes and that legislation hits you with penalties, there's really nobody kind of, you know, making sure that what you're submitting is accurate. These are the tools that we're going to need in a couple of years. So if you want to be an early adapter, you want to start thinking about this stuff now, right? And you want to get it into your building. You want to ingrain it into the way that your asset management teams are thinking and your property property teams are thinking. And then you can get that back to your tenants because I don't know if you're seeing it on your side. We have tenants that are now asking on the way into a building, are you lead? Are you doing this? Are you renewables? And it's not a, a nice to have anymore. It's you got to have or we're not even going to have you on our list, right? So, so it's really important. And it was really interesting to see the shift We've been talking to brokers about this for years, years. We've been talking to brokers about this for years. Now they're finally asking the property teams, hey, what, uh, what's going on with these renewable credits? And do we have this at the building? And what can we offer you know, the tenants coming in that are now paying attention? And once the tenants get engaged and we start you know, asking those questions, I think we're gonna really start to see things happen. Yeah, it's become a gating criteria. You know? mm -hmm. um, and to your point about the legislation, I mean, you don't want the first year that you're reporting for Local 97 to be the first time that you're looking at your <laughs> software and be like, okay, so how are we gonna take a look at this? You know, we have to report next year. Or God forbid, it comes 2025, you're looking back at 2024, I'm like, well, how did we do? <laughs> They're a little late, you know? Now is the perfect time to start mapping that out forecasting exactly what you're gonna to need to do over the next few years to really identify your, you know, your risk to mitigate that. And again, from the asset owner perspective, you're adding value. One of the ways you add value is you mitigate risk. If you're looking out in 2024 and you're seeing penalties, that's a risk. That's a risk not, to, not only to you as an owner, but to lenders, to investors, to tenants, they don't wanna be exposed to that kind of thing either. So you need a platform that you can measure it, data to help you forecast it, and then to inform what we're talking about in the category two, the projects that you need to do to actually get you where you need to be. Yep. And I think we know it's it's two parts, these projects, right? One is the, the transparency, the understanding of the data and how your buildings can be optimized. But then there's also the piece of what are you doing at the building? Are you changing your windows? Are you, you know, changing your, your chillers? Are you insulating all the pipes that you can be insulating? And we saw a wide array of products uh, and platforms submitted to us. And it was really encouraging to see that there is technology out there for us to address it at the building and then in the cloud, really. Um, so we're gonna hit it from both sides. And how are you kind of assessing which properties you decide to take on in that mix? I mean, I'm sure you're getting lots of proposals, lots of ideas, mm -hmm. lots of toys that you wanna look at. I mean, uh, what's your normal process for that? That's a great question. You know, it has to be customized. Every building has a different story. We have different tenant mix. I have a building that's 100 years old. I have a building that's 20 years old. It's not the same solution for both. So while you have to customize it at the building, I also want a holistic platform that I can have, uh, you know, my complete control over that single source of truth. So it is a balancing act. Um, and it's also whatever my guys give me money to spend. Um, you know, that's, that's key to it too, right? So if you're a vendor out there and you've got this platform, just because it's a cool platform and a cool tool doesn't mean we can buy it because it might not fit into our model. We might not have underwritten to add 15 cents a square foot in software costs when right now I've got engineers running around that can probably do it manually. And that's a hard conversation to have is, is when do we, you know, start relying a little bit more on technology for efficiencies versus our older way of thinking about things. Yeah. And I think I would caution some of the, um, the providers of these solutions not to approach owners and say, like, we can do anything you want to do. Just tell us what you want to do. That's almost too much information for owners to deal with, right? The ideal situation is you come with a kind of catered solution, and ideally you've done your research to say, hey, we know you made a net zero goal. You're going to have to track your progress here. We're going to help you identify projects, help you map your progress toward those goals, help you assess you know, opportunities going forward, but it shouldn't necessarily always be like, we can do anything and everything you want. We'll give you a neat dashboard. We'll give you all these options. Just tell us what you want to do. Many times the owner is looking for enough information to help us decide what to do. You know, Michael, I think it'd be irresponsible if we didn't address something up here too. You know, we, we manage pretty 
class A, you know, robust portfolios, but we're not the only game in town. And there's a lot of other owners out there that don't have dedicated groups that are thinking about this. There's a lot of class B and class C owners out there that either don't have the resources or the facilities or the staffing to absorb this. So while we're sitting up here on panels and we're, you know, pseudo experts of this industry, there's a lot of your customer base out there that doesn't have this level. So you need to know how to tailor your approach to them so that they could absorb it, understand it, and really filter through I don't want to call it noise, but there's a lot of competition out there, right? Everybody comes to us with really similar solutions. And how is this one different from this one? And how am I going to achieve my goals? So while we like to think we're the biggest audience in the room, we're not the only audience in the room. So, um, you know, I think that's important for the market to understand. Yeah, that's a There's a huge educational effort that goes along with that. You know, I've heard of, um, you know, many of these owners that are, you know, family businesses that have owned these, these properties for a long time. They're getting smart on it, but you know where to start, how to do kind of the low-hanging fruit on the projects, how to start tracking this information at scale that they've never really had to do before. And uh, you know, we're I'm mostly focused on office, but you think about like these large condo buildings, co-op buildings, they're facing some serious exposure with this upcoming legislation. And uh, you know, there's tons of solutions out there for them, but they're not necessarily being connected to them. So, you know, we've kind of gone through our list here. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of great stuff here. I don't know if this is a Q&A type of situation or uh, if we're just going to kind of wrap it up from there. What do you think? We have time for a question or two. All right. Let's do it. Mike, we forgot to plant questions. <sighs> but that was your job. Bonnie? <laughs> Bonnie asked, what keeps us up at night? And um, besides the typical fires and floods, it's, it's how do you get a handle on this? And really, how do we make a real impact in the industry? H how do we do that? You know, if, if, the, if that 60% energy user, those tenants aren't paying attention, how do we actually accomplish this? And not just buying credits to offset penalties. How do we really make moves to carbon zero? I think um, one of the things I focus on the most is really just education. And I know that kind of sounds funny, but I mean, this is a new enough field where you're making big decisions on relatively new information in a field that not many people understand. And so there's a lot of new experts out there. There's a lot of information that's coming from a whole new field of kind of new consultants, experts. And uh, what I worry about is the time and the energy and the ability to focus on actionable insight that I can trust to recommend to the people who are making these big decisions, to the owners, investors, lenders, tenants. I mean, if we're going off information that we don't fully understand, that's not fully vetted, that is hearsay, you know, this can drive us down the wrong path really quickly. And we have a fiduciary responsibility for our investors, for sure, but we also have responsibility for our tenants to the community. If we're making uninformed decisions, uh, I think that's very dangerous. And so, um, you know, I worry a lot about where do I get the right information? Who do I trust to give me that information? Can I trust my own data? You know, these things are um, really important. Uh, New York is uh, far ahead, I think. Um, you know, there are, there are only a few states out there, I think, that are as progressive as New York is in this area. Um, it can be challenging as a real estate owner to deal with that, but it's also invigorating. Like, it uh, changes the whole framework that you're working in. It changes the environment for making these types of decisions. It elevates your game. You know, it's, it's a, a different opportunity to do class A commercial real estate in New York versus other places, and especially in the context of carbon emissions and local law 97. I mean, this is cutting edge stuff that everyone's figuring out how to do and here more than anywhere. I think costs of uh, uh, utilities in Europe have been higher for a long time, and they've they might have a couple steps ahead of us on that one. But um, you know, we we learn, we we see what's out there too, and and we're we're following suit, so we're right behind them. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, last question, and then we're gonna get going to the presentations. Thank you for this, guys. Do you feel achieving net zero will fundamentally? 
fundamentally shift your roles? If so, how? Thank you. People always need to keep the lights on in the building, so I'll always have a job. <laughs> I mean, the nature of my job right now and, and for the past 12 months has been solely focused on our path to net zero. So I've got my work cut out for me for the next 20 years, um, but I would say that is going to be a defining focus of operations and asset management going forward anyway, is managing to net zero. It'll change our capital planning process, it'll change our reporting and what investors are asking for, it'll change how we market our space to tenants. So I'd say it's already fundamentally changed, changed our roles and it will just continue to do so going forward. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Thank you to the double Michaels. Uh, we're now going. We're now set for our first set of presentations, beginning with category one. I'm going to give you a bit of background to start before we get into the presentations. So this category, category one, is all about carbon measurement, verification, reporting, and accounting. As you all know, the ability to accurately measure and report on carbon emissions is vital to a building owner's ability to get to carbon net zero. So in category one, we ask the contestants to explore PropTech solutions that have uh, to help building owners to accurately measure buildings' carbon emission profiles, develop insights into strategies to reduce those emissions, and to track the effectiveness of carbon reduction programs with metrics. You'll be seeing presentations from two finalists today. Clear Trace, represented by Mr. Lincoln Payton, and Measurable, represented by Aaron Barranco. Now I'd like to turn it over to both gentlemen. Hello, good morning, great, then I can walk around. Um, so, I'm Lincoln Payton, I'm delighted to be with you. 30-year um, resident of New York, despite the accent, which hasn't changed that much. My background is in finance, but in energy. So, uh, I retired from investment banking a couple of years ago, and I was running the energy franchise worldwide for the biggest European bank, uh, investment banking in the Americas. Uh, and I sat on the ex-co of the bank, and particularly in that last role, uh, with a big focus on historical hydrocarbons, uh, I saw the energy world from a lot of angles. And the biggest missing gap that I wanted to be part of solving sensibly going forwards uh, was the quality data. And Michael and Michael touched on it from many tangents. Um, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, you can't talk about it, net zero, all this wonderful vague vocabulary, let's get some facts and some substance and some clarity here. So uh, I joined Clear Trace a couple of years ago. Um, what do we got there? Um, which is a fast growth company based in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'll tell you very clearly what we do. Um, and most importantly, I'll show you a quick demo, quick three-minute video demo that will really put some color on it. But I think for this audience, what's phenomenal is um, New York City real estate is really at the cutting edge point, and I think Michael alluded to it at the end, of those two big factors of reputational exposure, which you've all got whether you like it or not. You can be at the front of it or you can be lagging and the regulatory pressure that's coming. All the conversation worldwide about net zero, carbon hurdling, you can't do that if you can't measure and metric and then consequently charge for what's being done. And realistically, all the talk that's there, whether you like it or not, it isn't gonna get done on a voluntary basis. So regulatory pressure is coming to a theater near you soon. What do we do? Okay. Um, we collect data from any entity's energy picture from their points of acquisition and generation. So the actual IoT revenue grade meters at all points of an entity's generation. Michael talked about it, PPAs, VPPAs, RECs, whichever way it may be. Um, own rooftop solar, many of you using that as an option as well, windmills in the parking lot, and of course what you draw down from the grid. 
Uh, we do the same thing for all the points of transmission. So the ISO, the GATS data, smart contracts um, screened and collected, and the points of load. So the individual IoT meters in your own buildings, floor by floor. Um, all of that data is collected in real time, high quality, digitized, hung on a form of blockchain. Yes, sexy today, but we use it not for that, but because it's very well suited to the application. High volume, self-auditing in a world of vagueness and inaccuracy, very important, immutable and accessible with permission. So you have this digitized, complex tech stack with a full picture of, um, of your energy and your carbon coefficient megawatt hour by megawatt hour across your entire platform. Mike, both Michaels talked about a single source of truth in terms of knowing, understanding, and then consequently being able to manage your footprint. This is it. You can go in hour by hour, location by location and verify it. We load match, which means uh, we'll show you an example in a second that, that pertains to a couple of the people here. Um, we collect the data on carbon free energy acquisitions. In the example, we have upstate New York Hudson River system, track it ISO gats down to zone J into retirement, the Nirvana of wrecks, simultaneous production, flow, scheduling, consumption, carbon free energy proven QED. Move on to the next point. Um, that load matching is patented. It's uniquely applicable for local law 97 and the oncoming rush of similar city uh, regulations that we have. Uh, and then there's the marketplace. There will be a marketplace. You could almost argue there is today in terms of if you have a building that is taking the effort, managing their data, getting below the hurdle and the next door neighbor has not and will be paying fines marketplace. You have digital data, you have a digital wallet, you are in the best place to manage it. We're already tokenizing using that form of, uh, of blockchain to, to manage that well. A little bit of a, a, a more specific example, if you like, or numerical example. So um, New York is absolutely at the front of the world. There was a question about Europe. Europe is, is regulatory wise, I would say, ahead of the US. Um, but Local Law 97 is almost the purest tax hurdle that there is um, and, and is going to be the most specific because it's going to be building by building, clear data requirement. So um, what's the challenge? You know, you've got all the usual stuff. I mean, gosh, you've got COVID and everything else. Um, now you are going to have to do two things. One, report and manage what you do. And two, make sure that what you then actually do with that data makes your ROI work in an already complicated city real estate world. Um, very, I, I think most of you know these kind of metrics, but to show you that this is not uh, today a, like a fun toy, um, it really affects the, the ROI, ROI of every building you have. That's an actual building, it's anonymized, um, mix of steam and electricity power. When you coefficient it today, uh, you end up with a surplus above the local law uh, 97 requirements. You can only do something, by the way, with that surplus if you can measure it and manage it. So if you're not, you, that's wasted, that's given money. But what happens if you do nothing over the next five years? You end up in a penalty phase, which will basically put your building underwater. You'll also have tenants who think you're not very cool, you're more expensive, you'll have employees who are non-plussed by, uh, by what is going on there. Yes, demand response. Yes, windows. Yes, thermostats. All of that needs to be done, and you all know that. But you won't change that equation without changing where the energy is coming from and how you measure it and manage it. With the 24-7 measuring hourly, in detail, buying carbon-free energy, what do you end up with? You end up with a surplus of $2.7 million. And, then, and even with the tightened five-year schedule that we have coming, a surplus, which will trade, will be saleable to your next door neighbor. And at the very least, you get ahead of the whole reputational game uh, in, in terms of your tenants, in terms of your uh, employees and your, uh, your greenwashing story. Um, very briefly, this is again kind of how it works. And it's an example, and I um, thank you, Michael, for letting us use the example. We're going to talk very quickly about one Manhattan West. 
kind of one of the coolest buildings in, in the world right now, but very new. Um, you'll see on the demo how it works, but basically we go into the meters, upstate New York, Hudson River system of Brookfield Renewable Energy. We are reading those meters in real time. We can drill down into it and look at it. We scan the gaps and the ISO data scheduling down into zone J. We follow all of that, put it all on the blockchain, and then here's one Manhattan West, the individual meters, the individual me megawatt blocks. So we are able to load match. We can prove digitally, hour by hour, generation, scheduling, transmission and movement, if you want to think that way, and retirement. Wrap it up, REC, QED, carbon-free energy, unique. Um, that load matching, I believe today is the only comprehensive solution to what we have in the real estate, local law 97, and um, the equivalent you have in Boston and a couple of other cities coming soon uh, solution. This is a very simple one of the UIs. Um, I'm, I'm sure Michael believe, wishes that was the, the simplest we saw all the time. Um, but it gives you a very clear, it's an excerpt of a clear trace dashboard. This is one Manhattan West up until the middle of January. Running grid energy, you can see there's a green element. This is all hour by hour, auditable, buildable up upon and non-green energy. That's actually very significantly green because it includes nuclear. Some people like that, some people don't, but the data's there. What happens on January 15th when um, Brookfield turn on clear trace and their supply of green energy? We are load matching hour by hour from those, um, I'm hoping this goes backwards, from those facilities up there proving into one Manhattan West that hour by hour, provable, auditable, 100% green energy. That's the building going forward. So uh, one of the few ways I believe that you can actually prove, visually understand, then all the other smart things that Michael and Michael started talking about, you can think about doing. I'm very cognizant of the time. So, um, Michael, I think we have a little video. Hi, my name is Bobby Astrich, head of product at ClearTrace. Let's take a quick look at our platform. When we first log in as a real estate owner or corporate sustainability group, we see a high level portfolio aggregation of all sites. We're currently looking at the last 12 months, but I'll drill into last month, for example. We can also drill into a specific region like New York City. And in the top chart here, we can see our total energy consumption and the sources of energy generation fulfilling that consumption. So here we see we're tracking on-site technologies and clean generation or storage shown in orange, as well as off-site procurement of clean energy generation and associated credits represented in teal. We're also tracking the grid energy makeup and associated carbon emissions each hour in various grid regions. These three things allow us to track progress towards specific goals or other reporting standards, such as GHG protocol reporting. And we can also calculate positions and penalties from specific mandates, such as Local Law 97. In these charts, the underlying data of this teal offsite procured energy is ingested from the source generation facility and further enriched with carbon data and the resulting CO2 calculations. It is then processed through our patented load matching technology, which uses New York ISO transaction data to track the energy scheduled and delivered, thus creating a verifiable audit trail of energy procured and credits received, traced back to the time and location of generation and delivery into Zone J. In addition to local on 97 compliance, we track decarbonization initiatives through various lenses, such as 24-7 carbon-free energy goals, annual 100% renewable energy goals, or reductions from established baselines. Here we can see the 24-7 CFE percentage, and below is the breakdown of all categorical progress across on-site solutions, off-site procurement, renewable energy credits, and carbon intensity of the grid at large. From here, we can drill into a specific building, so I'll click into Stark Tower. And because we ingest energy at the meter level and at an hourly level, we can load match and understand how each site is performing individually. We can also audit records down to the individual meters themselves. And drilling down, we can get into the hourly attributions themselves. 
These are the digital birth certificates of every hour of every meter we process. This is also where we enrich the data with various carbon intensity metrics that can be used in different downstream calculation, calculations. This demonstrates the richness of the audit trail we can provide from all the data we collect. And we see these as being the foundational elements in creating energy efficiency credit That's for right. carbon trading opportunities in the marketplace envisaged by Local Law 97. Back to you, Lincoln. Uh, look, great. I, I'm uh, pretty close to wrapping up there because we do have to watch the time there. Um, but in summary, um, technology is rising up. The road is rising up to meet us in terms of solving these problems. Uh, very exciting. I've spent a year around the energy world, a year, a lifetime around the energy world um, without high quality data. This is different. This is game changing. This is IoT, decentralized ledger, um, telemetry. All of these things are helping us have the data to make good decisions. Um, I think you need it. Uh, I think it's exciting uh, and I think it's the solution of today. And the question is really trying to get out in front of it rather than always trying to catch up. So I'm delighted to be with you. You can see these advantages and use cases here, um, but suffice it to say, having the data, and I'm mirroring some of the things that the two Michael said at the beginning, having the data, having the information, being able to take action upon it. I don't think you've got any other alternative because you're required to at this point and you will be required to do it more going forward. So uh, delighted to be with you, delighted to be um, uh, honored and appreciated by, um, by Rebney. So thank you very much for having us. Everyone, uh, my name is Aaron Barranco. I'm the Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Measurable. Um, customer success is a SaaS term, so if you're not familiar with it, it's basically all things that have to deal with the customer. Um, let's see here. All right, so I've been with Measurable for the past six years. Um, when I started at Measurable, we had about 13 customers, about 13 employees. Uh, we were a really small shop. Six years later, we have almost 200 customers. We have 150 employees. We are the world's most widely adopted ESG platform for the commercial real estate world. On the slide here, you can see some of those logos. Uh, we work with some of the largest real estate uh, owners and managers in the world. Um, but we also do work with some occupiers as well. You can see folks like Twitter, uh, Major League Baseball. These are really fun logos that we get to work with. Additionally, that, that find value in our platform. We have uh, over 80,000 buildings in our platform, uh, 12 billion square feet of real estate, and we span the globe. So 90 countries and, and we keep growing. Uh, from a revenue perspective, we have, you know, almost $2 trillion in, in, in total asset value within Measurable. And in terms of how we've grown, we've really grown with the market. So back when I started, most of the customers that I was working with were managing their entire ESG program in spreadsheets. And they were calculating all sorts of data quality issues, data assurances, et cetera within those Excel files and then reporting them out to the world in either the form of a CSR report, maybe they were an early adopter of the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, maybe they were reporting to CDP, but for the most part, it was one or two people in an ESG program and they were doing all this stuff manually. Uh, we've seen that change greatly over time. Uh, as both of the Michaels were talking about, it's really critical to have a platform that is the source of truth for your data, where all of your information is centralized and that you can use to then report out on that information to any of those platforms um, or those benchmarks that uh, I mentioned. And as we all know, they are changing and we are seeing new benchmarks, new regulations uh, by the day. 
And I think one of the things that uh, both of the Michaels mentioned as well is that it's, it's really important to be able to trust that data and again, have a single source that you can use to, to manage that. So basically what you're seeing here is the, the results of our platform. As we've grown over the years, you can see that you know, back when we started in, in 2013 and um, we're pitching this as a concept to folks, uh, we, we didn't have too much information in our, in our platform, but uh, the square feet has grown, the, the spend has grown, the amount of capital um, projects and efficiency improvements that we track in our platform has grown, as well as the buildings, countries, et cetera. So uh, we've, we've really grown um, with the market. And one of the things that we really firmly believe at Measurable is that there should be a virtuous flow of data from the meter to the market. So from that electricity meter at your building to the additional electricity meters across your entire portfolio, um, there should be one place where you can access that data, where you can trust that data, where you can report it out, not only to these benchmarks, but, but to investors as well. And we're seeing, again, that there are all types of ways in which our, our customers are, are seeking to report out that information. So Measurable has a few different products. We, we have our core product, our core software, which is really a centralized repository for ESG data. Um, you know, we track energy, water, waste, carbon, uh, efficiency improvement projects, technical audits, certifications, ratings, ordinances, et cetera. And uh, we essentially wrap all that data up and allow you to, the, to report that out, again, to different benchmarks like GRESP or CDP that are asking for that information um, that otherwise you would need to gather from a variety of sources and put together manually. Um, so that's sort of the software component that you can see, and that, that sits really between the meter and the market there. Um, that sits at the building level. We also just recently released a data product. Um, so since we have 12 billion square feet of information in our platform, um, we've been able to take that data and begin to anonymize it um, and start looking at how we can estimate uh, building usage. So if you're an LP, um, you're sort of assessing maybe uh, buildings on the scale of 5, 10, 20, 50,000 buildings a year, um, but you don't necessarily have access to the data that is at that building. Um, we've been able to uh, take the information that we have based on the universe of data within Measurable and put together a data platform that allows you to collect large swaths of building level estimates that also includes publicly available data that isn't available anywhere else as easily as it is within Measurable. Um, so within a single click, you can download energy estimates, carbon estimates for, um, you know, again, 10, 20, 50,000 buildings at a time, um, ordinance data, certifications, if they are LEED certified, if, if they are ENERGY STAR certified, those are all things that, uh, again, flow virtuously into our platform. And then on the bottom here, you can see that we also introduced a professional services line. So um, being so close to the customer for the past six, seven years, we know that there are lots of ways to get data into, into a single platform and to collect it, but um, there can still exist gaps in that data. And so having a professional services function where you can have a dedicated person to assist with reaching out to tenants, to assist with reaching out to property managers, to help collect and verify the data that you're bringing into our platform is really crucial. This is some insight into our business model and I won't spend too long here, but um, we, we charge by the building and we think that that works really well with a lot of our building managers. And I'm just gonna go through some of our UI here. So portfolio analysis is one of the most commonly used tools that we have. This is where you can actually see the performance of all the data that's come into the platform. And Measurable is really like a data agnostic tool. We understand that building owners have lots of ways of gathering data, whether that's through real-time monitoring, whether that's through whole building gathering, whether that's through um, a you know bill pay provider and we don't seek to uh, necessarily discriminate there we 
sort of in our vision, want to make sure that you're bringing in and being able to analyze all the data um, based on the technology that you're using today. That comes into measurable. You can look at trends over time and customize and filter and export this, this, type, of, this type of information. We also look at data completeness and, and data accuracy. So one thing we found was that a lot of building owners found it hard to understand, okay, where, where exactly is my data living? Um, for, for, for how much of a certain building and tenant space and um, a common area am I actually collecting data for across different metrics? Um, we developed a, a platform where you can track that and, and understand the completeness, which should give you um, a bigger picture of you know, the accuracy of, of, of your buildings. I know I'm running out on time here, so um, I'll just run through two more of these slides. But one of the other uh, features of, of our platform is being to trick, track physical climate risk data. So um, you know, the question was asked earlier, what keeps you up at night? And I think for a lot of our customers, uh, physical climate risk data is actually one of those things. So um, we bring in a number of risk factors and pathways into measurable across your portfolio where your other ESG data lives so that you can understand the impact of potential risks um, based on those pathways. And last but not least, we, we, we help report out to investors. So I had mentioned earlier, Global, State Re Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, uh, CDP, uh, we, we essentially automate the flow of data from the, the data that you've collected in our platform into those benchmarks so that um, we can really take the burden of reporting off of you. Um, we have APIs with both of those. And again, by, by virtue of having data flow from meter to market to benchmark, um, we have really seen results with our customers and, and not saving them time. Um, a, a few of those, Digital Realty, um, one of the largest data center REITs in the world, they use our platform. I was their first customer success manager and we onboarded them, um, brought all of their data into Measurable, started helping them report to Grez and CDP. Um, they are now one of the leaders in, in their categories and um, we've, we've seen them consistently outperform their peers on a, on a year over year basis. We've seen this with other, with other companies as well. So I won't go through uh, these other two folks. I know I'm out of time here, but again, I just wanted to say that it's, it's, there can be a world wherein that you know, data does flow from that meter to market and having a source of truth that you can trust, um, where you can access that data, where you can look at the accuracy of it, where you can um, really start making decisions on it and, and measuring and management, managing it is, is what Measurable is, is, is really here to provide. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was the end of category one. Um, and the reason we only had two in category one was category two, building tenant and energy management and optimization is really a major focus. In fact, nearly half of our submissions were in this category. And as a result of the score, we actually had a tie in multiple um, scorings. So we were actually going to see five finalists in category two. Um, the problem set for, for this category was strategies to help reduce energy consumption through the deployment of energy management systems, products, and other technologies. And a few of the questions that each of the finalists were asked to address were, how does your solution help building owners use less energy to heat and cool your building? How does your solution help building owners and tenants manage and reduce plug load? And then how does your solution help engage and empower tenants to make optimal tenant solutions um, on the energy side? So with that said, we're going to get started. And first up, is Brainbox AI and Sam Ramanadori, their CEO, is going to do the presentation. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. I appreciate uh, uh, Nicerda, Rebney, and the other sponsors coming together to make this happen. Um, Brainbox AI, I will skip through the video not to bore everyone for two minutes, but it is available uh, online. So what we've, um, our problem set at Brainbox was basically looking at the real estate industry 
uh, and looking specifically at its biggest energy consuming category, so HVAC systems, and seeing a category that is just large by any scale in terms of energy consumption. And for the most, uh, in most cases, you're looking at buildings with a, a BMS that's operating in real time, uh, typically set up rule-based and reactive, generating all this data, and maybe not so for the most modern buildings we might be surrounded here by in, in New York, but for the vast majority of buildings that data is being created, stored on the local BMS, and then when it runs out of space, being deleted and thrown away. And we saw a real opportunity to take that data, uh, enrich that data with external data that impacts the building and specifically the heating and cooling of the building and applying uh, autonomous artificial intelligence to that to basically create an autonomous self-adapting uh, HVAC control system that's not just taking the data off the wall, the thermostat off the wall, or the various sensors throughout the system, but really taking a richer data set, of course, the, the, the big one, the very detailed weather information, but also occupancy were available, also external pollution data, also uh, carbon intensity of the energy it's consuming data, uh, and bringing that in and allowing, one, the AI to self-learn that building. And that's really solving one of the scale issues with optimization solutions is every building is unique, every system is unique. Um, if we're gonna rely on uh, people going to the building uh, to, to assess it and optimize it, we just won't be able to scale at the, at the pace that we need to. And so really having that one autonomous AI self-learning, that individual building literally getting down to um, creating on a zone by zone or room by room basis uh, developing the ability to forecast what's going to happen in that room from a thermal perspective for the next, we say, the next six hours, the relevant HVAC period, with over 99% accuracy. So you literally have a system today that is, um, that is reacting to an event that has already happened and to deal with a room too hot and too cold. And we're trying to convert that into a system that A, is self-learning that specific building down to the room level, being able to predict with 99% accuracy what's going to accuracy what's going to happen throughout the day, and then coming back with uh, uh, optimization decisions, literally writing back to the system and making changes down to the individual equipment level. So I can only imagine a building like this probably has a several thousand individual HVAC components to try to do that again on a human basis is just at a scale that's not possible. Whereas here, and we often point to the self-driving car, same concept, right? This vehicle that's learning its environment, having to take make estimates or, or guesses as to what's going to happen. Where is that soccer ball going to go? What's that bike going to do? What about that car? And in real time, make decisions to get you from point A to point B safely. Well, here you have a system learning, a technology learning that specific building down to the zone level and deciding based on you know, outside weather data, occupancy is, if available, et cetera, whether it needs to make different decisions than what is the base pre-programmed rules, uh, only knowing what's happening in the building right now basis. So that was the big heavy lift. Um, applying autonomous AI is uh, no light feat. Uh, there's a lot of money being poured into autonomous vehicles and they're still at it. It seems to be on our roads and starting to work, but you know they're not quite quite there. But it is a heavy lift. Um, the team today is uh, 150 about at Brainbox. Uh, over half of that is the technical team. So it's, it's no light lift. Um, but it is quite powerful because you're creating this system uh, as I've described it. And what's interesting is that cycle of learning, predicting and reacting does not end. So we install the system and have it learn uh, over a number of weeks how the building is reacting to these external factors. It then goes into autonomous mode, but that learning and that predicting uh, and, and ensuring accuracy never stops. You change something in the building a year later, um, the learning will relearn and, and adjust accordingly. So it is that constant continuous recommissioning that's quite powerful and quite economical when you're doing it with autonomous artificial intelligence. Um, the impact is quite meaningful, so we are uh, typically getting up to 25% reduction in energy consumption or energy savings uh, within, the, within the HVAC energy spend. 
um, the carbon footprint impact can be higher because we're often reducing peaks or shifting peaks uh, throughout the day. Uh, so your, your impact on the carbon footprint side is, is double that way. Um, and people often ask, are you doing this or achieving these at the expense of comfort? And we say quite the opposite, because if I know a room is going to get too cold two hours from now, my ability to keep that temperature within the dead band zone, within the comfort zone, is much more powerful than waiting for that room to get too cold, only when it gets too cold reacting. And so those natural swings in the HVAC system, are, the AI is constantly looking to, to flatten that curve and keep temperature closer to the, to the selected or tenant selected comfort settings. Um, so again, the, the way we define it, step one, self-learn the building. Step two, autonomously modulate the building. What's quite powerful about AI, and I think the reason why we'll never win a chess game again against it, or the Asian game of Go, uh, that, that you know Google designed a, a solution that was able to beat the grandmaster globally, and so never again will we win a game. Uh, if we're against these things is really because when it comes to multivariable optimization and very complex systems, it is very difficult uh, to beat a solution that's able to run through just thousands of scenarios and decide what the best outcome is. And what we find more exciting over time is that we started off and said, what are the goals of this autonomous artificial intelligence? And so clearly, you know, maintain or improve comfort, reduce energy consumption, reduce power peaks, uh, don't uh, cycle the equipment. In fact, if you can reduce the number of hours it's running and not cycle as a, it as much, you're increasing the life of the equipment. So you're giving it these goals. And we continue to add to it. Uh, so today we um, have a partnership with uh, Wattime um, to allow us to modulate the building based on the carbon intensity of the electricity you're using at that moment in time. Uh, I'll get back to that in a sec. Um, but it's quite powerful in that this multivariable optimization, you could just keep adding to it uh, and allow the system to make the trade-offs, never comfort, but the trade-offs versus uh, GHG emissions, costs, et cetera. Um, when we, when we uh, set out on this journey, the scalability of the technology was one of the prime directives here. So uh, we really made it such that we stayed away from replacing or in installing uh, additional equipment and building. Today, we install one edge device. And in some cases, we're able to do cloud to cloud connections or use drivers if certain systems are in place. So um, in a period where COVID limited our ability to travel in the last two or three years, we were able to, to deploy in buildings um, uh, across 18 countries around the world. And we continue to increase that count. Um, but the, the team, our, our mission is saving the planet with AI. The team is young, uh, is very driven by that mission. And uh, we always say, if we can't get it out of the lab and it's stuck in the lab, we're just not making an impact. So this is our way of, of showing impact and not just the geographic reach, but also the building type and size reach as well. So oftentimes, um, I think traditional optimization services are looking for that big building because they want that big utility spend so that the way the economics of the work makes sense. Uh, what's powerful, powerful about using autonomous AI is the fact that you can really reach the multi-million square foot uh, shopping mall or office complex, but all the way down to retail stores that are five, 10,000 square feet each. Um, and, and we are doing that range of, of building types. Uh, that works because of the autonomous nature of the technology. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. So next up is Ben Mendelson, co-founder and chief commercial officer of Hatch Data. One more, if you want to make sure that's okay. Uh, absolutely. Does that mean it's a party now? It's a party. All right. And thank you, Sandy and Max and the team that was involved uh, organizing and promoting the event. We're, this is our first time participating in the challenge and uh, very excited about the opportunity to um, talk about our company. Is this my clicker here? We good? Okay. Um, so Hatch Data. So we um, 
have been around for uh, more than a decade. So we came from our founding team, Vivek and I have both worked together for more than a decade uh, from cleantech pioneer Enernoc. Um, and Hatch Data itself was founded in 2019. So our group from Enernoc had separated from uh, Anel after the acquisition and founded Hatch specifically to focus on commercial real estate and the problems affecting commercial real estate. So today um, we have 550 million square feet, almost 3000 buildings. Uh, we work across most major markets in North America. In New York specifically, we've got roughly more than 30 million square feet uh, and we work across all asset types. So we do get confused oftentimes with just focusing on commercial office, campus office, but uh, we have beachheads in most asset types. The problem, can I get some help with the, uh, this keeps turning off. Yeah. Okay. We can skip through the prospecting slide for our competitors in the room, but we do work with reputable com companies, uh, many of whom uh, have assets in New York. So Hein, Boston Properties, Beacon, AEW, uh, Oxford all have assets uh, in Manhattan. Uh, and we really see the, the problem that we're solving as twofold. So we could submit an application both in category one and category two. So the first problem that we're solving is obviously there's a portfolio reporting challenge that organizations have, whether they're responding to GRASB, whether they're setting a decarbonization target, uh, their own annual sort of ESG disclosures, uh, CDP, et cetera. Like there are portfolio level challenges to wrap your arms around all that data. Those data come from different sources. They can come from utility bills. They can come from meters. Oftentimes owners have a challenge between directly and indirectly managed utilities. So those indirectly managed utilities can be a real pain if you're having to survey tenants on an annual basis to collect that data but you can use metering solutions oftentimes that uh, give you the ability with green leases to grab that data automatically. And so we want to help organizations with that. And then as these uh, uh, disclosure frameworks mature, local law 97, so if you went from 84, 87 to 97, you see that evolution. And we feel like GRESB is the same way and other, these other frameworks are the same way where they're going to be asking more of you to do more at the asset level. So you've You've reported and complied, you've set a target, what are you going to do in order to, to achieve that target? And so the, the trick here is the data that you're collecting for reporting and disclosure, how are you making that data extensible? So all that data that you're collecting for your GRESB report or for your annual ESG reporting can be used at the asset level. You have 100,000 employees in New York uh, in the building engineering, maintenance, cleaning trades. You've got people in the building that are responsible for maintaining those assets. So how are you presenting that data in a way that's clear and easy to use? And so if you're making, if you want to make progress toward decarbonization, you can make recommendations with that data and put that in the hands of those folks and able to get to your, your goals and your, uh, your targets faster. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, this in the demo but there's a number of different data types and there's often point solutions in the market with each of these data types. Um, but we will ingest bill data, meter data, submeter data, equipment level data from BAS networks or standalone IOT networks. So anything that you have, every building's a snowflake. I heard Michael and Michael mention that a few times. Anything that you have in the building will be able to centralize and that's what Hatch was built for. So you design the program as an owner or an operator based on your needs in the program that you want to build and depending on what you select, we can bring that into the data for analysis. And again, focusing on those operators, that's really where we want to differentiate ourselves in the market. We want to make it easy to consume for the operator, take the data, analyze the data, present recommendations on how to run the buildings more efficiently, and then deliver that, them those recommendations either through our application or your own uh, work order management systems, building engines, Angus, et cetera. We've got a number of, of integrations uh, stamped up today. So we'll do a quick, the video. Yeah, so I'll try to speak very quickly over this uh, recorded video, if we can swap over to that. But we've developed our application with uh, ease of use and simplicity in mind. Um, we have a mobile app, which uh, has real time and... Uh, oh, that is, that is 
Looks nice though. <laughs> so we have a mobile app that, uh, that supports real-time and on-site workflows. Um, but with the web app, uh, you'll see that we've focused on providing actionable uh, information that helps operators get in, get out, and get, it, get on with their day. Um, so whenever we'll have that up, we'll, we'll quickly, quickly run through that. Oh, you don't have it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Give us one second. Sure. You guys have anything to You want to keep going on the slides? Yeah, we'll we can. Come back. We, we we can come back to the demo at the end. Um, and we'll, we'll adjust the time, obviously. It's it's okay. I mean, we did have two case studies that we were going to breeze through at the end, so we can talk through that just uh, to, to put things in perspective. So the first is uh, Rubenstein Partners, so they're a firm based in Philadelphia. We started with one building actually in Maryland. Um, we ingest uh, bill data and meter and submeter data uh, for these folks. And the first building that we stood up was almost a, a bad example to use in this room because the, most of the buildings we look at in New York are fairly well run, but we saved uh, more, th more than 30%. Uh, and that was a great use case and they did a pilot project. That's oftentimes how we'll work with customers. We start sort of prove it. Um, and uh, since then we've rolled out across their uh, full portfolio of owned and managed sites. So there's more than 70 buildings on the platform and the results have been an increase in their Energy Star score of, of more than 15 points. Um, and what we're doing for these guys is really sort of a fully managed service. So it's um, all of their uh, ESG sort of uh, data collection, benchmarking, local compliance, uh, meter and submeter. So they're all of their tenant submeter networks uh, flow through Hatch. Uh, we meet with their engineers on a monthly basis to review the data and recommendations and help them with implementation and then uh, tenant submetering and billing as well. So it's a fully managed program for, for Rubenstein. Uh, Boston Properties, which has a large portfolio in New York, is a different type of case study. Um, we've worked with Boston Properties for more than a decade, and I think a lot of people look at these technologies almost as a project, where uh, it's um, you know you you do a, a retro commissioning study, where you you view persistent commissioning as the ability to come into an asset, uh, generate a return, and then it diminishes its value over time. And it's the opposite of what we saw at Boston Properties. Uh, so we started with meter level data across most of their assets, and we have more than 100 properties on the platform today. We ingest bill data, uh, uh, meter data, and equipment level data, um, and they view it as foundational for their energy management and ESG programs. Um, and even though the return we saw in those early years, I think it was about a 7% uh, ROI, or 7% savings in terms of energy cost and consumption across the portfolio early on, that has uh, shrunk over time, but the operational use cases that the engineering teams have developed in using the data, it's become almost standards based where they just expect to have this visibility and how they operate their buildings and we ensure that we plug into those workflows uh, at the asset level. And just before we get to the demo, perfect, but we'll just talk a little bit about, you know, this, this room is we're focused on you know how are we helping solve for decarbonization and what we're talking about really in what a real estate company or fund uh would use to pursue those goals are the, the first two steps you know it's centralize the data uh ensure that you're reporting and complying uh in the way that you need to and then ensuring that that data is extensible so that you're using that data to to uh, optimize the actual uh asset there's going to be a bunch of activities on the back end of this in terms of looking at electrification, not too quickly, uh, which we talked about earlier, but sourcing renewable energy, all that stuff. This, the, the interval data, the bill data, it's foundational for those exercises. So we support these activities today and we're gonna, as we go along, our product roadmap will continue to, um, to have more and more functionality focused on these, these items. So let's do a quick demo. Thanks, Sandy.
Thanks. So uh, as Ben talked about, uh, I'll show you here how the bill meter and equipment data kind of come together in our application. Uh, so you're looking at here, it all starts on the performance page where you can quickly check in on your portfolio or individual assets to see how they're doing. And so on the portfolio page here, you can compare individual assets by key metrics like energy intensity and baseline variance. And then you have some aggregate performance metrics here around uh, baseline and utility variance. Uh, you can dig into an asset either by clicking on one of those boxes if you've seen an outlier there, or you can click into the location selector here. So on the asset page, we have all the real-time commodity data, um, so electricity, natural gas, steam, uh, along with weather data. But one of the most used tools in our software is this, uh, our granular baseline models. So these provide an hourly projection uh, using past performance and current operating conditions to be able to see how the building's performing. And as you can see, uh, you, can, uh, you have different training periods to be able to see you know, how that building's doing versus pre-COVID benchmarks uh, versus kind of reoccupancy as well. Uh, we have some additional performance metrics here like degree day analysis. And then finally, you can see here where the bill data comes into play, uh, where you can track utility data variants using the financial data. Um, if you want to dig in, you can do that in Explorer to see all of your time series data. So you have a blank canvas here to be able to trend data over a date, uh, any date range, uh, any sort of interval. And you can do interesting analyses here to be able to see how tenant uh, load kind of compares with uh, energy demand. I have a couple examples here. So obviously you can you know, see how air handlers contribute to that overall load. Um, our platform also supports DERs today. So you see solar here and how that uh, interacts with grid demand. Um, and then finally, we have the BAS data as well. So electricity BAS data, we can connect to BAS data uh, through a variety of means uh, to be able to pull that in. But the core of our application, uh, the real value is in measures. Um, so as Ben said, our measures can be integrated with, um, uh, you know, you can manage them here or within uh, different work order systems. So with the meter data, we can, you know, identify if your early start is, uh, is not pro programmed optimally or if you have some loads that might be running 24-7. Um, but where we can really identify uh, the root cause, some really useful information is when we pull that equipment data in. So we've been in this business for a long time. Uh, we've, uh, you know, so our approach, we've, uh, we've built out heuristics with energy engineers uh, over the past decade and then also applied machine learning algorithms uh, to be able to provide these uh, recommendations that you're seeing here um, that, that really identify things that you may not be able to, uh, you know, kind of see or, or experience uh, if you're in the building. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's our solution. Thank you, Jeremy. Great job, and our apologies for the technical. No problem. You know, that's what happens when we're live. Yeah. So good morning. I'm Alexander Suma. I'm the CEO and founder of Ibis Power. And what I'd like to share with you today is a breakthrough solution for renewable energy on buildings, and especially large buildings, to make them sustainable, because that's a big challenge. Um, a little sneak peek, actually, it's already there, so I already uh, <laughs> shared the secret. But I'd first like to share with you a little bit of that journey that we went through. It's uh, more than 10 years ago that I did my PhD at the University of Miami. And living there as a Dutch guy, I saw how much society is depending on air conditioning. And of course, that's very logical in Miami. Um, but I also realized that all that energy was generated in a couple of pollutive plants in the north. And I was thinking as an architect and a civil engineer, why can't we do that differently and generate all the energy of that building at the building itself, getting it from its direct environment? And that's where a journey started and I went back to the Netherlands um, after my PhD. And actually here you can see all that product development, company development that we went through. And we had a couple of big challenges um, because uh, first we had to convince the academics because they didn't believe in windmills on roofs. They said it doesn't work, there's no proof, there is only bad examples. And the same for the market. We had to uh, convince them because actually early adopters had negative experiences. Um, but as you can see, we did a lot of product development and we got there. I think we cracked the nut. Uh, the nut. We have the data and um, I think we're the first one to say that we made wind energy on roofs work. Uh, plus we added solar to that. 
So why is this important? Um, for real estate owners, of course, um, but it's already mentioned a couple of times today, local law 97, climate change issues translated into penalties from 2024. Um, the energy cost increase, it went from 2020, 6.4% up to 2021. If that continues, that will be 36 cents per kilowatt hour in 2030. Why is that important for the real estate owner? If your building is not energy efficient, your tenants will pay high electricity bills and then your building is less attractive. And the physical limitations. When I talk to building owners who want to make their building sustainable, they just don't have the space on the roof to place enough solar panels. And, and that's a big problem. And that's because all the utilities are placed on the roof and you have to fit the panels a little bit in between. If I look at a larger scale for the city, um, we will use four times more electricity in the urban environment in 2030 because we're going to charge our vehicles and we're uh, replacing all that heating into electrified uh, building heating solutions. Um, grid congestion is another big problem, has also been mentioned. And from my experience in Europe, um, we are actually limiting the allowance of uh, solar farms and wind farms because the grid can't take it. And we're also limiting new real estate to be connected to the grid, so they're not giving permits. So that's something to take account of. And lastly, eight and a half thousand buildings in New York City are directly applicable uh, for a solution. Uh, well, actually not, they don't have a solution at this moment, uh, but we have one. And that's what I'm going to present to you. So this is PowerNest. It's uh, a wind and solar integrated rooftop. Um, it's called, it architecturally integrates. It's called uh, Crown on the Building by uh, architects. And it generates six to 10 times more than the solar applications currently available. It makes use of a secret sauce that we called aerodynamic enhancement. And I'll show that to you in the next slide. And it's applicable for new and existing buildings of five levels or higher, as long as they have a flat roof. So it's fully modular. I take out, no, we're going to the video. <laughs> Can I have the video, please? Yeah. Okay, so we're not going to the video. We're going to, wait, let me first have the, okay. Rotterdam is committed to fight climate change on the local level. And that's why we, together with more than 100 companies and organizations, made the Rotterdam Climate Agreement. And our purpose is to become a climate neutral city. What I especially like about the Power Nest is that it's a smart combination between generating solar power and wind power, and especially in a city like Rotterdam with a lot of rooftops. It was really nice to design with PowerNest as a design solution uh, for this project, a very sustainable solution. It was actually not part of our design in the beginning, it was part of the design of the other architect. But then the wind calculations came and it appeared that it was way more efficient to place it on our building, uh, where we are close to the river, we have a lot of wind coming in. First thing we said to the client was, okay, we can add it to our building, but we need three PowerNests, not one so that it can really fill the whole roof and it really can become a crown of the building and really part of the design. But we already have the design on the drawing table to produce even 25% more energy on the roof space. PowerNest opens this possibility even for the large buildings, creating smart, self-sustaining and healthy cities. Thank you. Can I have the modules on the screen? Yes, perfect. Um, so what is that secret sauce? And the movie that you just saw is our project in Rotterdam. We lift, that was the lifting day, which was done last summer. Um, but so it consists of modules. So what we do, we lift up that roof space 15 feet. We go over all the utilities and we go three feet over the facade. So we use more than 100% of the roof space. Now, the most innovative part is that we found a way to capture that facade interacting wind flow with our aerodynamic concepts and accelerate it towards the turbine, where the turbine uh, generates four times more energy compared to that it would be outside the building. We use the same winds and we direct it under the panels to cool the panels, makes them annually produce 10 to 15% more. And lastly, if we have a light, uh, light gray or white version, uh, we use, make use of the internal reflections 
by, by facial solar panels and we generate another 20 to 30 percent uh, from the bottom of the solar panels. So in that way we're able to generate six to ten times more energy on that same roof space. It does depend on the location of course uh, if there is enough wind available but in New York that's not a big deal. Um, so here are the metrics of that uh, video that you saw. Uh, it contains 144 solar panels, three wind turbines with that Venturi effect, and that generates 60 megawatt hours, which is sufficient for 30 apartments, uh, which is basically this whole building block. All the electric energy is generated by PowerNest. And this is the project that we're installing today. It's located in Eindhoven, a 220 feet high tower will generate uh, 120 megawatt hours from around 300 solar panels and four wind turbines, and that will supply 75 apartment of full green electricity. And here you can see the modules, uh, we're waiting for the crane permit. Uh, here you can see that the modules are fully ready. We assemble them next to the building and then a crane lifts them on top. So by the end of this year, and we're on track for that, uh, we believe that we'll have installed 14 installations in the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, and that means that we have a growth of 250% from last year, uh, no, last year, and uh, this year, five to 10 times uh, growth. But back to New York, uh, because I would like to share with you a project that it already has solar panels. And that's an ideal case for me to show you the what if they already knew about PowerNest. So you can see 24 buildings in Rockaway owned by NYCHA. Um, here are some metrics. Um, and I took out one building and we can place seven modules with wind on that roof and for the rest we use the solar. So today there's 88 solar panels installed that will, are generating 24 megawatt hours per year. And with PowerNest, we can generate 227, which is nine and a half times more power on that building. That also means a lot for the building resilience. Um, that's almost 150 kilotons of carbon savings per year. And that at a, uh, and I'm not gonna show, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details of the business case, but it's a six cents per kilowatt hour uh, for a 20 year investment. So if I look at one scale bigger, and we would have done all those 24 buildings, we would have created the small power plant inside the city. For, and that's 5.6 gigawatt hours per year, 12 times more than today installed, and 3,600 3, uh, 3, kilotons of CO2. And lastly, if I scale that up to New York City, where there's 8,500 buildings, um, we would generate almost two terawatt hours per year in the city. And that would save a lot of cabling from all those solar plants and wind farms that you have to bring in the city. So, uh, the uh, sorry? We gotta, we gotta stick to the eight minutes per. Okay, okay. So, yes. I need you to wrap it up. And this was the last slide. Thank okay, you very much. You all right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just testing. Uh, good morning. Thanks, everyone, for your attention and for your uh, efforts to put together today's event. Um, we're a young company, a growth company, but we set ourselves apart as being homegrown here in New York City. Um, we were founded within the uh, engine room of 345 Park Avenue, which is at the intersection of 52nd and Park and is the flagship building of root management company. But to be fair, we are a company and one that is growing largely as a function of many of the folks that are in the room today. Um, much of the early feedback we received originally from NYSERDA, um, we've received a tremendous amount of feedback from Michael and Michael, your respective colleagues at RxR and, and at Brookfield. Um, and I'm happy to say that we've been in the news quite recently, which I'll tell you about in a second. But in terms of objectives for today's session, I've got three of them. One of which is to share with you a playbook for how we can go about helping you all decarbonize um, in concert with tenants in your buildings. And of course, I'd secondly, like to identify some folks that might be great customers of ours. But then thirdly, you may have noticed that there's a cluster of participants in the PropTech challenge over on that side of the room. Vivek and Ben, I was sitting behind you. Aaron, I was sitting right to the, to the uh, sort of right and rear of you. 
Sam, I was sitting next to you as well, largely because I'm here to find partners. And that's largely a function of the fact that if we are going to save the world, or if that feels slightly uncomfortable to say, if we're gonna at least turn back the clock on climate change one building at a time, we're gonna to need to do it together. So with that being said, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Sonu Panda, I'm CEO of Prescriptive Data. We're an enterprise software company based here in New York City. And we are in the belly of the beast as it relates to decarbonization. So you may have seen, there's a bit of news that's been on the, um, on the wires over the last um, sort of two or three days or so. Um, we have been on an epic journey with JP Morgan Chase as one of the two key components of their Carbon Net Zero by 2030 program. Um, in fact, you probably saw me high-fiving with, uh, with Lincoln there because we've been collaborating for quite some, quite some time for the benefit of JPMC, but I have to admit with all this COVID business, we're meeting for the very first time. And if I'd known that I would see him here, I would have gotten my hair cut. Uh, in any case, um, four organizations that are leading with a carbon net zero first posture and position, um, we've developed a solution that's oriented towards the application of all sorts of artificial intelligence and machine learning logic as applies to every stream of data within their built environment. So to give you a frame of reference for, for the scale and scope of what we're looking to accomplish here, First and foremost, we've built an operating system for a building, which means any type of data from any type of hardware source, from any partner anywhere in the world, we're looking to find a way to, through our middleware, ingest that data, and with the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, make sense of it in real time from the point of view of intervening when there are negative patterns, amplifying and boosting positive patterns and doing it all with an eye towards first and foremost traditional smart building operating efficiency oriented objectives with decarbonization just being one of those key but very very important objectives so from a scale standpoint um, we started at 383 madison we're now uh, mandated to roll out prescriptive data's kit um, which we call nantum the name of our flagship building operating system across an additional 26 million square feet of space, which is all of JP Morgan's commercial uh, properties, owned properties, commercial lease properties, their specialty real estate, everything from real estate uh, uh, warehouses to their data centers, and then doing that globally and ultimately deploying across the nearly 800 million square feet that represents their uh, managed assets across all sorts of different types of real estate on a global scale. <clears throat> So with that being said, we've got a lot of experience doing this for base building owners and operators. We're particularly excited to announce that we will shortly be uh, rolling out an initiative on the backs of the R10 plus T initiative to enable owners and operators to profit from selling our solution into your tenants. And I'll talk through that in, a, in, in some detail in a second. But the long and the short of it is that Local Law 97 implies full building responsibility for owners and operators of real estate. It doesn't provide any relief for the fact that 60% of your carbon footprint or energy footprint is a function of your tenant's activity. And so what we are developing um, initially with our existing customers, which span everyone from Rudin Management to Brookfield to RxR um, here in the city to BlackRock on a global scale, JPMC on a global scale, as well as most importantly, the single largest centrally controlled and managed portfolio in the country, which is the USGSA. We're working with, a, uh, you know, with them to take what we've learned in the base building sphere and take it into the tenant sphere. So what you're about to see is a version of a playbook that we will be distributing ultimately via the World Green Building Council uh, that is specifically oriented towards owners and operators here in New York that have an appetite towards what I call cross-border transactions which is this idea of reaching into the tenant space and providing them with solutions that solve for whole building carbon footprint reduction. So step number one is fundamentally to meter everything, which is not necessarily breakthrough uh, science, but something that needs to be achieved at scale at an affordable level with a view towards creating a data-based baseline against which all the clever things that people in this room know how to do from a hardware and construction standpoint will then be able to go and do. The flip side to that is to do that in real time 
and also to do it with carbon emissions in mind, again, all in real time, taking into account coefficients from watt time, taking into account coefficients from companies like Singularity, and making sure that you can visualize your baseline position against which you're going to perform. The third step is then to be able to apply this sort of omniscience, the fact that we understand what kind of data is coming out of your water systems, the fact that we understand exactly what your HVAC systems are doing, the fact that we've got AI that's monitoring each of the individual stages within an individual chiller unit at 300 VESI. Take all that data uh, and be able to create a measurement and verification system that's IPMVP certified, that's ASHRAE standard compliant, so that when you do do hardware-based applications, you're able to do them with an incredible amount of insight into the kind of results that you're gonna receive. Step four is to get away from being particularly proud of how much benchmark reporting you're doing. Meaning, let's go from creating the data to analyzing the data. And let's provide you with those tools in an easy to use fashion. When I mean you, what I'm really talking about is building operators, folks that are as close to the problem as they possibly can be. Fourth, let's integrate all the newfangled stuff that you're already thinking about implementing. So when I think about the JP Morgan Chase platform, I think about my uh, partner, uh, Lincoln, in terms of all of the work that they're doing at ClearTrace on the supply side of the equation. And the way to think about this is that there's two sides of the token. One side of the token is about finding and replacing your dirty fuel sources with clean fuel sources. But the other side of the coin, which is where we spend all of our time, is true energy demand management, true energy cost reduction, and ultimately carbon fine avoidance that will then pay for all of these programs. Um, we do all of this, as I said, with artificial intelligence. And so when I say that I'm looking for partners, it's because the number that I signed up for at J.P. Morgan Chase is that by 2030, we will deliver to them 40% global energy demand reduction. That's worth roughly $1.2 billion to them in savings as a function of how much they spend today on energy. And I can't do it myself, which is why I can't wait to partner with everybody that's on that side of the room. Step seven, um, leverage the fact that you have economic drivers already on, you know, in your hands that we can turbocharge. So one of the things that we'll be shortly re uh, revealing is a service offering where we'll give you back 100% of your, your demand response dollars. We can do that largely because we can replace the traditional manual demand aggregation you know, service providers completely autonomously using software. Step seven, <clears throat> we will enable you to integrate with whatever measurement tool or climate accounting solution you choose to use. We, of course, recommend ClearTrace. We've got a terrific built-in integration with them, and that is battle-tested, and that's being deployed at scale. Uh, and then lastly, all of this data then becomes the basis for your REC strategy, for your offset strategy. Um, and just to sort of emphasize my point around partnership, you'll notice that this is not a prescriptive data or Nantum screenshot. It's quite the opposite. It's a clear trace uh, um, a screenshot that contains not only supply side data, but it contains data coming out of Nantum, our flagship building operating system. And then lastly, it's important to actually close the loop. And so whether you're an HQO user, a lane user, a uh, VTS rise user, again, back to the theme of partnership in order to deliver meaningful outcomes. Or uh, for the record, if you're a Nantum tenant experience app user, all of the data that we capture can then be provided on a highly personalized basis to the phone that an actual tenant employee is using. Meaning again, the same theme of we empower building operators because they're the closest to the problem and therefore are closest to the solution. Let's empower employees within the tenant organizations to take action where they see the problem and actually be the solution. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Soto. Last up, Matthew Isaacs, VP of Business Development from Radiator Labs. Well, thank you, Sonia. That was a really inspiring presentation and it's great to be in the company of all these fantastic prop tech companies. Again, I'm Matthew Isaacs. I'm VP of Business Development at Radiator Labs. And give me one moment while I learn how to use this thing. Yes, green for go. Um, so at Radiator Labs, we're decarbonizing the world's legacy buildings. 
And um, given that we're in New York City today and New York City is 75% radiator heated, this is probably a problem that all of you encountered at one point or another. Uh, radiator buildings are, there we go. Radiator buildings are you know, insanely durable. Most of them are a century old or more. Um, but over time, they've become extremely unbalanced. And because of statutory, you know, basically you'll get a lot of cold rooms in the building and a lot of really overheated rooms. And because of statutory heating requirements, we cater to those cold rooms, vastly overheating the majority of the building. And obviously that's extremely wasteful, expensive, and horrible for the world. So our core technology is called the COSY. It's an insulated radiator enclosure that traps all of the heat the radiator makes inside of the insulated enclosure. And it has a sensor that reads the room temperature, a sensor that connects to the radiator. And when you know, a user walks up to the cover, they'll set their desired temperature. When the room falls that, beneath that desired temperature, the fan will turn on, send heat out into the room. And when the temperature is satisfied, the fan will turn off, the remaining heat will be trapped inside of the cover. Um, that allows residents for the first time or users of these buildings for the first time in history to have accurate temperature control, converting these radiator buildings into kind of forced air like systems. Moreover, oh, excuse me. So by the way, these covers are for all types of radiators. You might have seen uh, you know, traditional cast iron radiators, fin tube radiators, baseboards, recess convectors. We retrofit all of these types of, of uh, kind of metal thermal mass radiators inside of older buildings. But the system as a whole includes that thermostatic radiator enclosure with the sensor that measures radiator temperature and room temperature, an app where residents can schedule their temperature, but they can also walk right up to the cover themselves and turn the temperature up or down, and then an analytics platform where all the data coming out of the room temperature and radiator temperature and steam trap temperature that we're measuring gets sent to the cloud and then in turn sent to the boiler controller of a building. This is a, just a brief uh, snapshot of what our app and dashboard look like. I won't dwell on this too much. Um, this slide is probably the most important uh, slide that I can share with you guys today and I'll try to do this quickly before I do run out of time. But um, this is a 75 unit building, um, same heating degree day. Um, we installed on January, uh, January 26th, we measured the temperature of the building. March 6th, after installation, you can see that each column represents an hour of the day. And there should be rows, there aren't. Imagine that there are 75 slices throughout. Um, before installation, there's a tremendous amount of sauna-like rooms. It's really uncomfortable. A lot of frigid rooms and just a pretty varied temperature band throughout the building. Post-installation, you can see that the overheating is practically eliminated. Uh, there's a lot of comfortable areas in the building. And the system doesn't work magic, but the amount of frigid rooms is greatly reduced, and all that sensor and sensor data informs us as to where they are. In this particular building, it was a roof insulation issue. So, uh, the company's been around 10 years. Sorry, I didn't really get into that information, but over those 10 years, uh, we have 25% average fuel cost savings. Uh, for customers that do track this kind of information, we're widely deployed at Columbia University, and they actually track this stuff. There's 85% fewer maintenance calls and 95% fewer heating complaints. Um, we can skip right over this. We have a lot of customers. We win a lot of awards. There are not many people innovating in the radiator heat space. Uh, the system is fully validated by NYSERDA, and we're in the New York State Technical Resource Manual, so we receive incentives and rebates from Con Edison, National Grid, and all of our utilities around the country. Importantly for this group, the technology is also written into local law 97. So as an alternative compliance pathway for affordable housing buildings, um, we cover about seven of the 13 prescriptive elements that building can, can undergo to comply with local law 97. So I, I mentioned there haven't, hasn't been much innovation in the, in the radiator heating space. Uh, the last, I'm not sure if that's for me or not, no, but no, okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. Uh, last innovation in the radiator space was uh, it's called the thermostatic radiator valve invented in Europe for hydronic hot water systems. 
invented nearly a half century ago. Uh, they're pretty ubiquitous here in New York, but they really do not work well in STEAM systems because they fail every couple of years. Your property managers, if they have radiator heated buildings, are probably familiar with steam trap and TRV replacement programs. Our system doesn't suffer from any of those lifetime issues. It's a radiator cover. It's virtually indestructible and also allows the building to really begin to participate in peak shaving and demand response and all these other exciting technologies. Um, this is an example. This is the same building that we looked at on the slide of all those columns. It's a LaFrac building. It's 100,000 square feet. It's in Brooklyn. It's a single pipe steam building. It's actually the most efficient single pipe steam building in New York City. And it's already compliant with local law 97 2030 guidelines with the simple addition of insulating the pipes and adding cozies to the radiators. Um, you guys are probably wondering what this kind of stuff costs. Uh, we sell it up front. It's generally a two to seven year payback after rebates, but we also deploy it on an energy services agreement, zero cost up front to customers, uh, guaranteed savings for a contracted period of time. This is an example of what the energy services agreement payments might look like. Uh, this is a building in Soho. I can't see the numbers, but it looks like they save about $2,000 a month uh, at zero cost up front. So they just enjoy that $2,000 a month of, of savings. Uh, and then when local law 97, 2025 kicks in, 2024, 2025, that kicks up to like 4,000 bucks a month and fine avoidance. Um, this is what we're, this is probably why we're here today. Radiator Labs has been around for a decade. Um, most of you have probably heard of it, but what we are doing now is combining our our core product, the Cozy, which I've just told you about, with window form fat, excuse me, window form factor, commodity consumer heat pumps that we control. So we go through a building replacing their window ACs or through wall AC units. And in doing so, we can combine the window units with the legacy steam system with Cozy's and decarbonize the building by 80% for a fraction of the cost of traditional electrification. This involves no electrical upgrades, no 220 throughout a building. And I would like to remind you, most of these buildings are unducted and don't have much technology in them besides a boiler in the basement and maybe an elevator. Um, you have no invasive construction, no core drilling. Um, it's a permanent installation with in, you know, insulation around it. So it does cooling. A lot of these properties have never had cooling before, but also high COP heating in the shoulder months when it makes sense. And then when it gets really cold outside, the legacy system will come back on or time of use pricing, for instance. Maybe it makes more sense to you heat the electricity at night when, when the time of electricity costs plummet or um, participate in demand response or peak, peak shaving events. So this allows radiator heated legacy buildings to get 100% local law 97 compliance, even through 2030. And uh, some general benefits of why we think hybrid electrification is the right solution for legacy buildings. And some pretty pictures. I think I beat the time limit. Thank you very much. Matthew, given you have one minute, does anyone have any questions for him since he went on the top? <laughs> and then I, I also want to add one thing that I appreciate you did as an owner and landlord is people need to think about what's the cost and what's the savings because a lot of these systems can be expensive. So you really need to think about that because it's not only, sometimes there are ancillary things that you need to do, whether it be to your network or your building. So some things to think about. So I appreciate the fact that you include those. So we've got time for one question because the, the bonus for going under. Awesome. With that, Yeah, so I mean, the steam is generated via either you know Con Ed uh, district steam or natural gas in the basement or even oil. Uh, all of those different carbon-based fuels have different local law 97 associated penalties, but ultimately you're using a lot less steam to heat the building and you're shifting a lot of the heating load to electric. So you, you do avoid local law 97 penalties. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you.
Next up, I'm going to introduce strategies for building decarbonization panel. And the panel is going to focus, as I mentioned, strategies for building decarbonization. I'm really excited because it brings together folks from both the public and private sector to talk about this critical issue that really gets to the heart of today's event. This discussion will help us understand three things, the decarbonization approaches being pursued by building owners and developers, the hurdles that will need to be overcome to support this important work, and three, the role that technology will play in helping it make all ha it all happen. Our moderator today is Rebney's very own Zach Steinberg. He's the SVP of policy, who leads Rebney's policy work on sustainability and decarbonization issues driving today's discussion. Before his work at Rebney, Zach worked in policy roles across the public sector, including experience at the NYC's Comptroller's Office and the US Senate. Now I'd like to turn the conversation over to Zach. Zach, thank you. And, um, I know we are a little tight on time, so I'm just gonna dive right into this and uh, just quickly introduce the folks who are participating and say, um, this is the second week in a row I've got to sort of pick some people on a panel, which means I get to listen to interesting people, and I hope you all will agree at the end of this conversation. Um, so, so going from uh, closest to me to farthest from me, we have um, Molly D. Ramasamy, who's the head of deep carbon reduction at Jaros Baum and Bowles, one of the leading engineering firms in the city, country, maybe world. Um, Ed Bricker, who is the senior engineering manager at the Durst organization, uh, our host, thank you, Ed, and a co-chair of Rebney's Sustainability Committee. Uh, and farthest from me is Patrick Oshai, Director of Market Development at NYSERDA. And Patrick has been, uh, and the rest of his team have been really incredible partners for this event. Um, and so many other efforts in this area where they are really um, finding ways to make all of this possible. So thank you, Patrick. Um, I think let's just dive right in because this is a really important moment for this conversation. The pace of change when it comes to building decarbonization seems to be getting ever faster. Whether it's owners scaling up their own commitments tenants demanding better office space uh, and their own corporate goals, or policymakers and regulators pushing change, there's no going back to where things were just a few short years ago. So I wanted to start by thinking about a couple of perspectives from the approach of how are building owners thinking about this? And so maybe just start with Ed um, to put you on the spot. So the Durst organization has been one of the leaders in terms of building and operating sustainable, efficient buildings. Uh, what has been your guiding approach to that work and where do you see it going in the years ahead? All right, so thanks, Zach. Uh, you know, the Durst organization's a 100 plus year old company. And one of the neat things that we do is we don't just build, we build and own and we hold. Uh, this building that we're sitting in was built in the late 90s and we've held onto it ever since. Our oldest property is about 100 years old. So we not only get to develop and think about construction and how to decarbonize new buildings, but we also look at them as they come up for their capital cycles as well. Uh, and the short answer is, how do we think about it? The way that we think about it has evolved over time, right? Where once upon a time, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, in a retrofit project, you're really looking at a chiller replacement. Everyone kind of thinks of that one big central machine and how you can best economize that, select the most efficient piece of central equipment, that thinking changes over time, right? The, the project is no longer about just kind of what that one big thing you can do is, and we're starting to get out into the buildings, uh, like Sonu and Matthew have been talking about. We're gathering more data all over the place, and we're kind of looking out at those, uh, those tenant pieces of equipment, you know, the perimeter piece of equipment in, a, in an office building, all those terminal units, because in buildings, tails kind of wag the dog, right? What the tenant or piece of equipment, that terminal piece of equipment out there is doing and how well it's controlled is gonna determine how much those big pieces of equipment, the boilers, the chillers, et cetera, how they use their energy and how we can most economize it. So, you know, nowadays we're really thinking about it differently than we did maybe 30, 40 years ago. And we're looking out past, you know, just keeping the projects to the mechanical room and we're going in and we're trying to make those equipment all the way out on the fringe as smart as they can be so we can gather and leverage that data from them as we go on. Thank you, Ed. And so, Patrick, let's just turn to you. So you've overseen at NYSERDA several innovative programs that have challenged building owners, design professionals, innovators, folks in this room to really push the limit on emission reduction. So I'm curious, what have you learned from those programs so far and where do you think they'll go next? 
So l let me start with, uh, so what we've learned is that we have the ability to shine a light on good solutions. We, we invest um, in, my, in my teams about $125 million a year. Now that may seem like a lot of money, but when you start to look at the cost of capital investment, it's next to nothing, you know, when you, when you look at the total of capital investment. So we've really tried to leverage that in demonstrations, in shining a light on better solutions, in sharing, doing analysis and sharing data, what works and what doesn't, because what works really matters in the, uh, in the real world. Um, so we have learned about an incredible amount about uh, what our vendors are capable of, the collective vendor community. We've invested a lot in, in uh, qualifying vendors and helping uh, building owners find good vendors. I think the other thing we've learned, you know, nothing, nothing to do with the clean energy space, but uh, the importance of trust and relationships. And I think that our, I think that our collective investments over the last five years. Um, with the large commercial real estate, with Rabney and other organizations, um, we've built we've built strong relationships. So, um, which which facilitate two way communication, and really, when we have something we're trying to get attention to in the market, um, it's been very receptive and easy to do that. So, we're really pleased with that. I think the thing I want to focus on going forward very quickly, we can't just electrify the the thermal load. Uh, with air source heat pumps. So that just is a, it's a partial solution, right? So we're gonna electrify, we're gonna electrify a lot of heat load with air source. Um, but there's a lot more energy in water or the ground. So we need to do a lot more with geothermal or water source heat pumps. We also need to do a lot more with green hydrogen. Once we build those big wind farms out in the ocean, and they're generating electricity uh, when uh, nobody needs it. Uh, you know, we can give it away or we can store it. So there's gonna be an opportunity there. But I think more directly to this group, we really need to re-engineer the thermal dynamics of the buildings, the thermal load. So envelope is the only no grat solution under every scenario of better envelope. I mean, that, that works. And then also using technology that allows us to more finely control uh, where the thermal load is going and also the capability of moving thermal loads in building. You know, the, you know in New York, uh, we have a constant problem of, uh, we have a windy side of the building, we have a sunny side of the building, right? And so there is this constant issue of how do you move, how do you move thermal load where it needs to go? Great. So Molly, let me just turn to you. So when we met several years ago, you were an engineer, and then we met a few months later again, and you were the head of deep carbon reduction. And I think that was happened somewhere in between local law 97 passing and then uh, people realizing we got to get ahead of this. So you work with a lot of developers, owners. What are you hearing from your clients about how they're approaching this challenge and what's changed uh, since you got that new title? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think our clients are watching the trends of what's happening in terms of decarbonization and then the broader ESG movement. And I think many people at this point have sort of bought into the idea, some of the ideas, in fact, uh, that Patrick was just mentioning about rethinking how we design systems, specifically heating systems, and how we electrify those heating systems in a way that makes sense. Um, and so I think what we're seeing a lot from our clients is a desire to kind of do the right thing, to lean into the decarbonization movement, but they're looking for solutions that, you know, are grounded in reality, that are practical in implement implementation, and have an eye for some of the business side in a way that hasn't necessarily been asked of, I think, designers in the past, right? So, you know, we're looking for cost-effective and space-efficient ways to electrify buildings, and we need to have a broader awareness and our clients are asking us to have a broader awareness of what's happening, not just in the building industry, but in the power sector, in policy development, right? And so, you know, I think generally speaking, everybody is using this as an opportunity to take a broader view of how we can sort of change the course of history and our impact as it relates to climate change, um, and to be really innovative, right? 
I, I think in the building industry, when I think in, in, of design and construction and engineering, you know, there's very much in the past been sort of a tried and true, you know, you, you know what the rules are, you know what the rules of thumb are, and you kind of execute well on what's well understood. And now we're, we're in a completely different kind of outlook where I think our clients and service providers in general are saying we need to be, you know, more clever about this. Let's, let's iterate. Let's be innovative in our thinking. Let's try different things and learn some lessons and come back and try to apply them to get to that point of optimization between the cost impacts and the space impacts and the tenant impacts while still doing the right thing. So maybe we can transition for a minute to, to talk about tech since that's why we're all here. So Patrick, NYSERDA announced its own technology innovation challenge to support building decarbonization um, a few months ago. So tell us about the thesis of that program and how can the folks in this room help? So in, in conjunction with the Empire Building Challenge, which you might be more familiar with, where we built, uh, we solicited for a cohort of 10 in our funding demonstration projects, we are uh, moving $10 million into the innovation space to try to bring uh, new technology. And I would say, when I say new technology, new to New York technology, uh, but used elsewhere in the world to New York and to New York's buildings. So we have been engaged with uh, multiple uh, countries, mostly over in Europe, um, in terms of the various approaches to uh, decarbonizing uh, buildings that are common in Europe. I mean, I'll just give an example. One of the technologies that's been around for a long time, and it happens to be in the Heinz project, that um, that we're funding as part of a demonstration are chilled beams. And um, I, I was fortunate enough that in 2009, I was involved in a building that was designed by the in, in, a European engineering firm, and we had chilled beams in there. But there is a relatively low energy passive way to move uh, heating and cooling in a building. So there are technologies out there, but we hope to, again, use our money to um, shine a light on, on technology, um, do the studies to show what works, and uh, help build relationships between those technology vendors and the New York real estate market. So I wanna ask um, Ed and Molly to maybe turn on Patrick and give him some advice. So if you could wave your magic wands from the chairs you sit in, what would this technology challenge try to solve for? Well, I'll take that one first. <laughs> sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab here. Um, you know, I think as a mechanical engineer, the solution set that we're working with primarily right now, they, they are heat pumps and the New York City environment, dense urban environments in general, air source heat pumps tend to be the solution that are an easier fit than, than geothermal, for example. And, but you know, they, these air source heat pumps, they come with challenges, as we've all talked about before. They're big, they're very expensive. There are multiple vendors, but there's still a relatively few number. So you know, sort of the competitive nature can be challenging. And then there are the, the sort of depreciations in performance in cold weather, right? Although that's gotten much better in the last five years. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for innovation still. And I would love to see an air source heat pump that's super small footprint that uses a low or no global warming potential refrigerant, uh, and that's easier to, to integrate with existing systems, right? Maybe it fits on a louver, maybe it you know sits inside the building more easily. I don't know exactly what that solution is, but um, you know that's a solution category air source heat pumps that we're getting comfortable and familiar with, and I'd love to see more um, better technology that makes it easier and uh, you know more streamlined to deploy, so that people like Ed can say yes instead of saying ah, it's really difficult to you know fit this in my building, or I just don't have the space on the roof, right? Or whatever the scenario may be. Yeah, so to, to translate the, ah, I don't know, into you know, developer speak, we wanna manage risk, right? So we wanna manage risk by kind of using these established technologies, technologies that people have evaluated and successfully implemented in their buildings previously. And thank you, Molly, for mentioning, you know, low GWP refrigerants, because, as we start looking at all these buildings that maybe didn't even have cooling systems before, we're adding, not sarcastically, tons and tons and tons of R410A, all of these refrigerants that 
you know, if uh, if let loose, if somebody drops something, hits a refrigerant pipe, et cetera, uh, not only go out into the atmosphere, but could also potentially go into a living space as well. Um, you know, if I have to be like dead specific, I'd say that, you know, CO2 based refrigerants and heat pumps almost feel like fusion technology, like it's always 10, 15 years away, right? Um, but there are quite a few, you know, CO2 manufacturers moving out of the refrigeration space and into the comfort cooling space. Uh, you know, we've started doing some due diligence on those as well. Um, you know, but even outside of like the very specific uh, refrigeration machine topic, the problem that we need to solve is data, right? And I think there are a lot of companies here that are starting to do that where uh, I'm not sure, I think it was Sony's presentation where he was talking about, you know, making sure the data gets into the hands of the people that really need it. Don't get me wrong, I'm a data geek and I would love to just sit there like on my terminal all day and play with trend lines and all that. But I'm also not the guy running the chiller. I'm also not the guy, you know, out there trying to fix the individual terminal unit that's misbehaving. And I'm not the guy trying to do the preventative or, um, or not trying to do the predictive maintenance on those units. So trying to get all of that data from those units that we are retrofitting, right? We're taking induction units, which are a very passive translation dumb technology and turning them into these very smart things. We're putting actuators, we're putting IP connections on them so you can get all of this information back to a head end, but all of it's not helpful if it's not in a usable format. So I'd say if I had a magic wand, I would, you know, I would get some kind of technology that could, uh, you know, not drive the ship, but tell the guy driving exactly where it needs to go. So Patrick, you'll get on those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'll make sure they're all plug and play. There right? we go. Yes. Well done. So I'll just ask one quick question of the group, and then happy to open it to a few minutes of audience questions. Um, Obviously, one of the reasons we're all here and one of the reasons the PropTech Challenge this year is focused entirely on getting to carbon net zero is owners, developers, managers, the industry collectively is under significant regulatory and policy pressure to reduce emissions. That's particularly true in New York, but I think that's a global trend. And so how do you look out at the world and foresee government policy evolving in the future? And what do you think signals, um, regulations, et cetera, that the technology community in particular should be looking out for? I mean, Patrick, go ahead. I think Patrick wants to say something. Go ahead. Now I'd like to listen to your view first. I'll, I'll, I'll comment, but. Go ahead. I mean, I'm going to say the regulations, hopefully, will get smarter, right? They're going to start driving down into like the deeper, finer points of energy use. Uh, and get away from, you know, kind of like the big club that is annual energy consumption. And you're gonna start getting into, uh, you know, time of use information, and you're gonna start driving really into, you know, solutions that talk about thermal storage and economizing those uh, in a way that makes it make even more sense for developers. And, you know, God knows we've been ahead of the curve on that. We have two ice storage plants uh, within two blocks of here. But for, uh, I think, you know, the large part of the industry, there's a lot of hesitation around that because it's not necessary right now in their mind. Um, so I think you're going to start, you know, we'll hopefully see government regulation and those market signals pushing you more towards, uh, you know, thinking about not only how much energy you're using, but when you're using it and how you're using it as well. Yeah, I Did I give Molly, you enough to in? Molly, go ahead and then we'll let Patrick close. I would absolutely agree with that. I, I think, um, you know, Local Law 97 as an example was a, a very disruptive piece of legislation, right? It, it put the focus on greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector in a way that hadn't been done before. And so in that way, you know, I think it has been a successful policy in that it woke a lot of people up. However, to, to Ed's point, right, it, it's certainly not a perfect law. And there are going to be, I think, um, you know, iterations and revisions throughout the United States on the model that is Local Law 97 that works at shifting the focus to the right metrics, but also the finer points of how people are using energy and when they're using energy. Um, I think the point that I would make in addition to that is that the trend is clear. Right, I wouldn't expect policy to take a step backward. I wouldn't expect it to happen less frequently, right? I think we're gonna see more and more of this kind of thing, right? Um, in different flavors, and I think it's gonna happen across the US, it's already happening across the world. The, the trends are very clear. And I think, you know, what's interesting to me is those policy mandates in a lot of ways have translated 
sort of to the general market and what people as consumers are asking for. And, and I think that's what you're seeing when you see this sort of broad focus on the ESG movement, right? Maybe everybody started thinking about this stuff because of policy, but, but this has made it into the mainstream now. And now that it's in the mainstream, it's certainly not going away. If anything, it's just gonna pick up in speed and fervor. So, you know, the, the hierarchy tends to be, there's policy, and then law, and then regulations, and then funding, right? And I, I tend to work on the downstream side of, of policy, which are what are the regulations. So I have a team that designed the, the New York State Stretch Energy Code that New York City adopted. And then also, obviously, you can see programs that NYSERDA is funding. I mean, I, so I have to translate policy into something that's actionable, something that's affordable. And then I have to understand that um, it's an asymmetric world. Um, as challenging as decarbonizing large commercial real estate is, the fundamental issue in New York State is going to be decarbonizing affordable multifamily housing and the, and the cost of doing that and how is that going to be paid for? So there are, um, you know, there are areas where we can make progress more rapidly. Also new construction. So I'm aware of carbon dioxide um, being used as a refrigerant in a lot of the new, the new construction that's, that's fully decarbonized. Um, so new construction can move much faster. So there's certain segments of the market that we need to support because they're going to be the leaders for figuring out how to do something, figuring out what works. They're going to be the place where they're the resources to bring solutions to scale for the market. And then we, the real challenge is how do we come up with the, uh, what would I call it, the downsized scaled solutions that can more cost effectively be delivered across the remaining houses. But that's that's a, that's a place that I look and I don't, I don't think directionally the policies are going to change at all. I think the directions are clear. I think that um, right now we're seeing the challenge of how fast can we move um, given cost, given cost of energy, given inflation, uh, given interest rates going up, which just affects capital construction. It affects investment, right? So um, I think we've got, a, we've got a two or three year challenge, plus we do, we're just getting out of the disruption of COVID, which I think the building in terms of, do we, do we have the right amount of office space, retail space, housing space? I think that's being worked out as well. So this is a challenging time, but directionally I think things are pretty well set. So why don't we take maybe one or two questions? Sandy, you have time? Sure. One or two? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I've got a question that kind of follows up on Louise's question about international examples of, of, um, of, of best practices in terms of energy efficiency rating systems. I just wonder if there's anyone on the panel that's looked at um, what Australia has done with Copenhagen and um, international international environment rating systems, which is quite similar um, to the local law in 97. So, so the question for those who didn't hear it um, is to what extent folks on the panel have <laughs> looked at other rating systems used across the globe, including in Australia? I was gonna say, I'm not familiar with them, but I hope that Molly is. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not familiar with the one in Australia specifically, but um, I think across the US, which is where I tend to focus most of my attention, um, I think there are seven jurisdictions right now that have true performance-based standards two of which at this point are carbon focused. I'm curious to know if the one in Australia that you're speaking of is performance based on, on greenhouse gas emissions versus something like EY. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there are other examples that I'm aware of, don't know as much, you know, in the UK and, and other sort of requirements that put restrictions on what can happen with real estate depending on performance rating. So yeah, just curious to know, is it greenhouse gas based or, or EUI based, the one that you're speaking of? UI based. Yeah, I'd say that's probably the most common one. Um, you know, it's, uh, EUI in a lot of ways is an easy one to 
base up performance standard around because the access to the data, right, to calculate an energy use intensity tends to be pretty widely available. Um, with greenhouse gas, and I think, you know, the reason that we're, we're only seeing two jurisdictions right now in the U.S. that have a standard like that is because it's not as easy to kind of get and crunch that information. Um, but I think we'll start to see those kind of come about more and more. We have time for one more, maybe? What exactly is the kind of data and temporal resolution, annual, monthly, hourly, needed for real estate, CapEx, and operational planning? So, I mean, ideally, we always operate with hourly. Um, I'm not sure where to look for the Zoom audience, but just generally to everyone, I guess. The, uh, the Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so the... I mean, the resolution you're going to look for, uh, realistically, if you have 15 minute data, that's beautiful. Um, but hourly data typically, you know, cuts it pretty well. Uh, anything beyond that, and you start to have a lot of trouble if you're trying to do anything with regard to heat recovery, thermal storage, et cetera, it gets really tough to break down the resolution to get to the sizing criteria that you need on the CapEx cycle and that development cycle to be able to economize that decision. Um, anything, you know, really less than an hour and you're starting to rely more on the energy model than you are the historical data. Um, and we've made great use of, of energy, not energy modeling, I'm sorry, um, utility submetering. Uh, when we did our renovation at one, or this pointing next door, because I think of in one Bryant Park, but in this building at 151 West 42nd, we were actually able to downsize a lot of central plant equipment uh, because we had had BTU meters on the, uh, on the chilled water system for a year prior. And I believe there was originally something like 5,000 tons of chiller installed at the building originally. We were able to cut that down to 4,000 because we realized that the building really only operates above 3,200 tons for, I think, three or four hours a year. Um, so at that point, you know, we can ride through those kinds of, uh, you know, those kinds of hits. If I could follow up to that very quickly, um, I think that hourly data in general, even for energy service providers, you know, kind of outside of the, the real estate investment cycle conversation is immensely helpful. I, I think there could be an argument made for doing all energy related benchmarking and hourly data, for example, and I think that would help people make decisions in a, in a better way, you know, having that granularity at their fingertips. Great. Anything else online? Um, if there are more questions, we still have time for a few more questions. If you'd like. One more? If not, okay, well, I think we're the only thing standing between folks and eating, so that <laughs> probably means we should wrap up. So I wanna thank um, Patrick, Ed, and Molly, and um, uh, look forward to seeing you all this afternoon. Well, I wanna thank the great panel, thank you for, for that, and I wanna thank all the presenters. Um, thank you everybody on Zoom and in the audience. Uh, we're gonna wrap up our morning session. Uh, we start again at about 1.30 with the afternoon session. We have two more categories, another fireside panel, so a lot of great innovation and technology. Um, just so everyone knows also that over the next several days and weeks, we will be posting the demos, the videos on our U Prop Tech channel, YouTube channel, so all that will be available if you've missed anything. Until then, everybody, thank you again. Have a great lunch, and we'll see you back in about an hour. <laughs>